Penny is now joining. Good to see you again. Let me see if I, you can hear me. Good. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this presentation uh, of the 10 New Insights in Climate Science 2019. This is a highlight of the latest advancements in climate science um, across all the different dis disciplines. It's produced by Future Earth and the Earth League, uh, two major uh, research networks. Um, the, uh, the slides and the report will both be available um, at a link we'll be sharing at the end of this presentation. Um, we have been expecting uh, the UNFCCC uh, Executive uh, Secretary Patricia Espinosa for this section. Um, she hasn't come yet uh, and is therefore substituted by um, Martin Frick, who is the Senior Director at UNFCCC. Uh, with us here is also uh, Professor Johan Rockström, uh, the Director of Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research. Um, and also the co-chair of the Earth League uh, and the advisory committee of Future Earth. With us is um, Professor, Professor Sir Brian Hoskins, uh, former founding director and uh, current chair of the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment. Um, here next to me is Wendy Broadgate, uh, a global hub director at Future Earth. Uh, and uh, I am a science officer, Eric Peel, science officer at Future Earth. Um, so, Martin, would you like to start with, uh, with a short introduction from your side? Yeah, thanks very much and a very warm welcome. Apologies that Patricia can't be here. As you can imagine, the negotiations are quite intense. Um, this is the third time that we are doing that, presenting the scientific must-knows, and it really meets I believe a key issue in all of the climate change um, debate and negotiations. As you know, for many years, oh, here she is, wonderful. <laughs> Good, Patricia, please. Okay. Thank you. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Hello, nice to meet you. Oh, thank you. So, uh, Executive Secretary, uh, Martin was just uh, uh, starting on, on your behalf from the UNFCCC. So. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for stepping in. And uh, I, I did manage to, to come here. And let me say I really uh, put a lot of um, uh, interest uh, in this uh, because of the importance of science for our process. So I want to begin Penny by is now exiting. 
I want, is it okay? Yeah? It's, I want to begin by thanking Future Earth and the Earth League for presenting this extremely important report at the request of UN Climate Change. It is the third year that they have done so, and the information they provide is vital to our process and to people everywhere. This year marks the 25th anniversary of UN climate change, and from day one, science has provided the foundation for our work. I cannot emphasize enough how crucial it is that we have this information and that it is not only available to parties, but to all people. Because addressing climate change, as we continue to stress, is not the job of governments alone, but includes all segments of society. And people must understand the most basic science around climate change. This is especially important these days with opinions and viewpoints coming at us constantly. In a sea of competing voices, science must be our common language. And what the science is telling us is very, very clear. We are facing a climate emergency, and we are approaching a series of tipping points. We must act urgently. I sometimes have the sense that because we have been doing this for some time already, it has become like the normal. But I want to emphasize today, it is really it is really important that we take action now. And we are celebrating today, this year, the 25th anniversary of the convention. It's a long time, 25 years. So the window of opportunity that we have is really very, very small. It's difficult to say how small or how big but I would put it in, in, in the following terms. It means we need to act today. We need to take the decisions and to, to make the right policies today. There is no more time. The Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said it really in a very eloquent terms at the opening of the conference. He said that by the end of this decade, we will be of one of two paths, and the end of this decade is, is really basically today. We are in one of two paths. One is the path of surrender. The other is the path of hope. And right now, as this report clearly shows, we are on the wrong path. It points out that climate change is faster and stronger than we ever expected. That oceans are under threat, that land is under threat, that forests are under threat, that biodiversity itself is under threat, that we are all under threat if this continues. We are poisoning the very foundational elements that keep us alive on this planet. So how many, how many more reports do we need to have in order for us to act? The science is working on it. They are desperately working and working also, and this, this is why I appreciate so much this report, desperately finding ways of bringing this knowledge closer to the people. Thank you very, very much uh, for this. Because climate change is a threat multiplier. It is tied to almost every major development channel the world faces poverty, food security, clean energy access, and much more. Specifically, the report stresses that undernutrition will be the greatest health risk of climate change, such as decreasing nutrients in food, in food, fresh water, fish, die-offs. Who will this affect most? It will certainly impact all people, this crisis actually does impact all people. 
but it is most affecting people in vulnerable communities throughout the world right now. It's not a future consideration, it is here. The Secretary General and I attended the Climate Vulnerable Forum just a few days ago here at the COP. Uh, some of you maybe were there. This message that climate change is affecting people right now was very clear. People are dying right now. They are suffering right now. We must act right now. We must, of course, act now on several other issues as well. And the report makes this clear with respect to infrastructure, for example. It shows that existing and proposed energy infrastructure commits us to 850 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions. And this is twice the budget available for stabilizing the climate at 1.5 degrees. We will never reach our goal if we continue on this path. We must remember that the world's population is not expected to decline over the coming decades, but to grow. These people will require infrastructure just as we require it now. But it must be done differently. We simply cannot continue using the same resources in the same way we are now. And this includes major industries, including cement, and steel, and especially fossil fuels. And we must keep coal where it belongs, in the ground. I will stop here, and I will let the experts present you with more precise information. What can I can assure you is that I will be reminding all parties, and other groups, of course, of this report as they continue their negotiations here at COP25. It serves as an important reminder of the need to significantly boost their climate ambition. We really have no time to waste. So thank you, thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you, thank you for the report. I really appreciate it and I, I look forward to continue working with you closely together because communicating about climate change is one of the most important challenges that we are all facing. And of course, uh, UN climate change, the United Nations is not a communication agency. So we can get the knowledge, we, have, we base our work on the science, but we need help to communicate it. So thank you very, very much. Mm. Um. Thank you, Secretary Espinosa. Uh, we will continue with the presentations. And uh, due to the slight delay of starting this, I'll just remind all speakers to keep it a little bit short. Mm. Thank you so much. Thanks, Patricia. Let me start in a way at the end and just to say that um, uh, following very carefully your statement here, Patricia, I can say that every word you said has very strong scientific backing. This is the situation we're in. Our conclusion is, in the 10 new insights on climate science, which, as you should know, comes from Future Earth and the Earth League, which together forms the world's largest international community of global sustainability, earth system science, and climate scientists in the world. The purpose of this document is exactly as Patricia says, to try and make a super summary of the unequivocal mountain of evidence that we have from the IPCC, the IPBS, the UNEP, that report, all the phenomenal advancements in science. And the conclusion is that 2019 is a bad year for the climate system, it's a bad year for humanity. That we have more evidence than ever before of the impacts that is hitting across communities in the entire world. That we have more evidence than ever of the risks we're facing, that we're approaching potential tipping points, but in particular, that we're running out of time. And that when you put all this together, yes, there is scientific support for declaring a state of climate emergency. Let me then walk through the first insight here, which in a way Patricia has already summarized, which is the evidence that we're not on track to reach the Paris Agreement. We have 
Just since a few days ago, the latest report from the Global Carbon Project showing that we are continuing to increase emissions in the world exactly at the point when we need to bend the curves. All the scenarios in the IPCC 1.5 report actually bend next year. So we've come to this point where now is the time for action at the global scale. But exactly as Patricia pointed out, which takes the data that we have compiled in this document, that just with the existing coal-fired plant infrastructure that is being built and being planned during its entire lifetime, we would be committing and consuming two times the remaining global carbon budget to deliver on the Paris Agreement. This just shows the scientific support for us now to come to the end of the fossil fuel era. But of course, it also includes the reminder that we're now on double-digit numbers on renewable energy and solar and wind. So we can scale very fast on the fossil fuel-free energy systems. And this is the challenge, not least in the policy negotiations. Over to Brian, then, on uh, Insight 2. Good to talk about the uh, global climate and the observations show that the global warming is continuing. In fact, the last four years are the warmest in the record. And this year looks as if the temperature will be similar to the maybe numbers two and three of that. So it now seems that a global temperature rise of one and a half degrees above, above pre-industrial levels could actually be reached nearer 2030 than 2040, which was the mean projection given by the IPCC. Sea level is, uh, rise is accelerating, and it's now three times higher than the average for the 20th century. So in the last decade, the rise has been near four and a, rather more than four and a half millimeters per year. And that's more than three times greater than that in the 20th century, which was near 1.4. Much of the uh, faster rise in the sea level is due to contributions from reductions in the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. And there's real concern here because consensus among experts have grown that these regions are more sensitive to the warming of the planet and less stable than we had previously thought. And that previous IPCC estimates of the change in the ice sheets and the sea level rise were probably too low. As well as carbon dioxide, atmospheric concentrations of the next most important greenhouse gas, methane, have been rising rapidly in the past five years. There are a number of reasons that perhaps could be for this, but the main reason is not known, but it, it may be due to increased emissions from tropical wetlands in a warmer world. And if so, this raises concern over possible positive feedback from this mechanism. Thank you. So can I move on to slide three then? And, and slide three is about the, uh, the mountains. And um, the mountains are very special places because they get colder going up and one gets particular ecosystems there and they're very important for water supply. And so away from Arctic, the Arctic and Antarctic, mountain glaciers are melting at a rate that corresponds to about half a meter in depth every year. And the highest losses are in the southern Andes, the Caucasus, and central Europe. Mountains are very important in the water supply for many people. And changes in runoff from mountain regions could, by mid-century, affect the water supply for over a billion people. And climate change will also irreversibly affect mountain ecosystems and their biodiversity reducing the area of biodiversity to hotspots and causing species to go extinct and compromising the capacity of mountains to provide ecosystem services. Right, over to impact four. To onto forests. Um, forests are a very, very important ecosystem for our planet. They, as you may know, they absorb about 30% of the anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic CO2 that we emit. Um, but we are chopping them down. Um, deforestation is a, a major source of, of CO2, and that's um, us you know, removing the forest for uh, croplands, for agriculture, for pastures. 
Um, and a lot of this de deforestation is actually driven by trade from external forces outside of the region. The increases in temperature that we're seeing due to global warming are also resulting in drought and tree mortality. And the combination of drought and um, human uh, deforestation is actually creating uh, many more f fires, um, which are actually um, threatening forests as carbon sinks. And this map shows uh, some of the areas where fire has been increasing. Um, you can see that the anthropogenic forest fires are, are very strongly um, driven in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And then if you add the, the drought uh, effects, we're also getting wildfires um, in the Western US, Alaska, Canada, Russia, and Australia. So these are, are, are really um, driving trends in um, forest loss. Back over to Brian. Brian? Thank you. Yes, so moving on to insight five then, uh, which is about weather extremes and, uh, and severe climate events. So record-breaking extreme weather and climate events and their per impact have continued to dominate the headlines in 2019. I say continue, but probably more than ever. And these range from flooding and droughts to heat waves and wildfires. The increases in these events are consistent with what we expect from our basic understanding from basic physics. And it also increasingly models can give an estimate of how much more likely these sorts of events are to occur because of the increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Increasingly, societies will have to adapt to compound events events happening simultaneously around the world which can amplify the risk of severe impact significantly and also to cascading events which uh, do not leave societies enough time to recover from one before the next event happens. We don't often talk about the ocean having heat waves but it certainly does and the temperature anomalies have reached almost seven degrees in some places this last period and these can be mostly attributed to anthropogenic climate change. Right, over to Insight 6. So just to interrupt briefly here, uh, we're privileged to have with us uh, the Minister for Science in Chile, the President for this year's COP here in Madrid. So we would really love to have you join us here on stage and also give your perspective on uh, the 10 new insights that we're now providing to the UNFCCC and the negotiating process here in Madrid. I think he's, he's coming. Okay. He's coming. Okay, he will join us great. Okay. He will join us when he comes. So let's continue then with Insight 6. Okay, so I, I'll continue with Insight 6 on biodiversity. We can see that biodiversity is sort of the, the guardians of Earth's resilience. Um, biodiversity is very, very important. Um, that it provides many ecosystem services, such as carbon storage and um, other ecosystem services. So we, we see them as the, the guardians of, Earth, of Earth's resilience. However, the new research shows that between one and two degrees of warming, we will lose up to 14% of land species. Um, we know between 1.5 and two degrees, the um, coral reefs go from being seriously threatened to be uh, lost altogether at two degrees, 99% of coral reefs wiped out. And the heating of um, water in freshwater lakes is likely to result in a die off of fish, uh, a doubling of that die-off by 2050 in the Northern Hemisphere. Over to you, Johan. Yeah. So there's a major drama that is playing out right as we speak with the scientific evidence that increasingly shows that for us to successfully deliver on the Paris Agreement, it's not enough to decarbonize the energy system. We need also a transformation in the food system. The single largest emitter of greenhouse gases the single largest cause behind the biodiversity loss that uh, Wendy just, just ran through. But this insight this year, we're also sharing the latest science that is actually now increasingly establishing that increased temperature and increased carbon dioxide will in itself reduce the re nutritional quality of food in the world, undermining our possibilities of delivering the sustainable development goals. So not only is global warming causing more extreme events like droughts and floods, reducing yield levels, it's also impacting the quality of rice 
to be able to raise people out of the fact that unhealthy food is today reducing or shortening the life of, on average, 11 million people per year. So here we have a, a real challenge of a transformation in the food system, which is equally important to deliver on what we've promised in Paris. Over to Inside 8. So as uh, Patricia mentioned, uh, climate change is already affecting all of us, but the most vulnerable and the poor will be the hardest hit by climate change. Um, almost 100 million people could be pushed below the poverty line by 2030. And we could see hundreds, tens to hundreds of millions of climate migrants by 2050. This is because um, these people are much more vulnerable to droughts, floods, higher temperatures, and other natural disasters. And the, the chart I have here um, shows the multi-sectoral risks. And you can see from the chart, the, the darker colors, the pinker colors, are showing that those risks due to climate change are much greater in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. Next slide, please. So social acceptance is a very key uh, part of the success of climate policy. Uh, science shows that fairness and, fairness in, and distribution and trust in governments is very important for um, policy success. And equality is also um, extremely important for societal resilience. Um, inequality be has been identified as an important factor when resource depletion has led to um, societal or civilization collapse in the past. Um, so we need to learn from, from these issues and create a society that is, um, has, uh, doesn't have uh, severe inequalities and that policy is sensitive to the social um, context and, and that policy is seen as fair and acceptable to citizens. So you've uh, certainly followed uh, closely what Patricia Spinoza kicked off with, the evidence from science that we have physical tipping points in the Earth system where we can risk a situation of unavoidable or unstoppable changes in thawing permafrost and burning forests and losing ice sheets. But there's also increasing social science evidence of social tipping points that can lead to very rapid, exponential changes in behavior, in lifestyles, and in technologies. And we're summarizing here what the state of science is currently. What is the evidence that we can see big lifestyle changes or moral shifts in our attitudes to fossil fuels? And the empirical science shows from historic data that once you have civil uprisings, a non-violent uprising that represents roughly 3.5% of a population in a nation, that can be enough to cross a tipping point that can change the logic or the regime, even in dictatorships. Now the question, of course, is what does this mean in democracies? And what does this mean, for example, for the youth movement in the world, which has in some countries reached that level? In Germany, for example, on the 20th of September, the numbers were estimated at something like 1.9% of the population. In New Zealand, it was actually 3.5% of the population that were on the streets, demonstration in favor of climate action. Are we approaching a social tipping point also in citizens in the world supporting the climate action that is negotiated in Madrid? And that is a question mark, but we're summarizing the science of the state of, of the knowledge in the 10 new insights. Thank you all. Um, you'll find both the report uh, and these presentation slides on uh, this uh, website. So is the minister in the room uh, presently? Uh, we have only uh, two minutes left. Um, so I'm thinking we could take a, a question uh, otherwise. He's coming. Yeah. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll take questions uh, in the meanwhile. I see two over here. If you can take those two at the same time. Yeah. And please identify yourself. Uh, uh, thank you. Marlo Hood with uh, Agence France Presse. I have a question for Executive Secretary Espinoza. Um, regarding this process, the, the, the UN climate process, and as you yourself pointed out, um, if you um, allow uh, 
the production of coal-fired power that's in the pipeline to carry through that that alone is going to to break the carbon budget uh, by, by or, or is, is twice what would be an allowable carbon carbon budget for 1.5 um, and yet in this process um, representatives of, of the fossil fuel industry are extremely present uh, I think they have the largest number of accredited observers as compared to any other group they organize many sessions um, every day does that mean that you think they are a constructive partner uh, in this process and is it perhaps time to revisit their role uh, in this process. Mm. We'll take that second question as well, and then, then um, the Executive Secretary can answer that question. Hi, it's uh, Alfonso Soria from Scientists Warning. And my question is, uh, we are talking about the carbon budget that we still have, but some top scientists like uh, Dr. James Hansen in the US or David Wastel in the UK, they say that the carbon budget has been used up already. So what would you say to that? Thank you. Patricia, would you like to start? I'll take the, the first question, and then I, I, I will leave you with the, with the second one. Um, regarding, you know, what I, I really think is that we need to get everyone on board uh, in the transformation that is needed. And that includes the energy industry in general, all together. So we, we need to engage with them. There is, um, a, I have been engaging with the, the oil and gas industry uh, as much as I can whenever I am invited. And I have to say, they have been uh, inviting me to, to some of their, their important gatherings. Um, there is no way that we will make this transformation without the a energy industry altogether, including oil and gas, without um, a, achieving the phase out of, of coal. Uh, so we need to work on this. And for that, we really need to be engaging with everyone. Governments, of course. Uh, he, here, um, you, you speak about the presence of representatives from, from oil and gas companies. I don't know whether whether they are really a majority, but that's, that's a, a, a different point, because we have, uh, for this year, we have over 8,300, uh, Ministro, por favor, over 8,300 8, observers um, participating, uh, which is a record number, by the way. Um, but we do need to get everyone, everyone on board. And, um, I think that uh, if you look at the oil and, oil and gas climate initiative, what they are, are doing, it's an initiative that brings together 13 of the most important oil and gas companies. Um, yes, it's not where we need to be. It's far from there, but they have started. So we, we need to be working with them. Um, I'm very glad, for instance, to note that uh, this conference, uh, I'm sure, made an influence to have Repsol, the Spanish uh, uh, company, to announce that they will be a net zero uh, car uh, carbon by 2050, that they will implement now a plan towards that. So I'm, I'm looking, I don't know the details of the plan, but I saw the, the announcement. I'm looking forward to, to see what, what com ne comes next. Thank you. There was a second question on, uh, have you already, already used up the carbon budget? So maybe one of the presenters can take that quickly and then we'll leave over to you. I can, I can take that very quickly. So according to the latest IPC assessments, we have roughly 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide left to emit to stay to have a reasonable chance of reaching the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, limit. Now, it is true that in that estimate are not included, for example, risks of losing methane and carbon dioxide from thawing permafrost, which would reduce that by another 100 gigatons, is the estimate. It's also true that that assumes that we take care of the remaining ecosystems on Earth, that the resilience and carbon sinks are intact. Nothing happens with the Amazon rainforest, that things are kept stable. So, of course, Jim Hansen, a close colleague and friend, you could argue that if you don't believe that we're able to take care of the biosphere, there's a risk that the global carbon budget is, is sort of say, consumed. 
My conclusion, though, is that we have still a window open, but it's very narrow. We're emitting 40 gigatons per year today. You take 500 divided by 40, you have 10 years. We have 10 more years. And that depends on ecosystems still continuing to be a functioning carbon sink. There was an update also um, on, uh, on Wednesday from uh, Joey Rogelian and the Global Carbon Bud, uh, Project uh, on this, saying that we have between 230 and 400 gigatons left as start of 2020, depending on if you want to aim for 50% or a 66% chance of one and a half degrees. So I leave over to you, Mr. Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me, Patricia. Uh, to this conference. Mean, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and I just want to mention briefly. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. yep. I if I may just make a very quick introduction um, to say that uh, under uh, Chile's presidency, it, this has been the first time under our process that a COP presidency puts in place a process to involve the science and uh, uh, that the Minister of Science of Chile has been personally uh, bringing together colleagues around the world in order also not only to provide their scientific knowledge through different um, fora and networks that uh, scientists uh, have, including the IPCC, but also you know, to contributing directly and to make the science, the, the, the science in general, more visible in our process. So thank you for that, Minister, and it gives me great pleasure that you could make it and share a few words with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, as I was saying, uh, I am the Ministry of Science for Chile. Uh, this is a new ministry created uh, just this year. It's the Ministry for Science, Technology, Knowledge and Innovation. And we really have a name to promote, uh, understand, and use the science we fund. Um, our main goal is so that science can be an integral part of development, of well-being, and the development of our territories. Uh, and regarding COP25, when, uh, when Chile, uh, when Chile uh, stepped up to be president of COP25, the president of Chile asked us to get involved by articulating the scientific community so that this could be a COP meeting with a strong scientific, uh, scientific emphasis. Uh, what we did to make that happen was to uh, pose the question whether we could make this COP different with and without a Ministry of Science uh, uh, as part of the presidency of COP25. What we've done we organized a virtual meeting of ministers of science from around the world. We had that the day before yesterday with uh, 18 countries participating. It was the first time that a meeting uh, of, of science ministers uh, was held at a, a COP. Uh, we have also uh, members of our team in the negotiations delegations of Chile. Uh, we organized a scientific committee a scientific committee that worked throughout the year to produce a report on seven topics that were thought were, were main uh, issues uh, for this COP, and these were oceans, Antarctica, energy, adaptation, cities, biodiversity, and water. They uh, worked throughout the year, and they produced a report of the local conditions in Chile and recommendations for public policy, and uh, I'm happy to say that they, uh, they handed me the report uh, the day before yesterday. So we have also you know, a Chilean scientific committee working during uh, the year uh, for COP25. And now we have a report that we could base public policy in. Um, I think for Chile, this is, this is very innovative. Um, we have a new ministry that now articulates the scientific community, and in that regard, the report and the recommendation is going to be key to transit to public policy. Um, and this is where we now want to use the experience, on the one hand, to promote the incorporation of science uh, as a central aspect of future COPs, uh, and also work uh, with scientists and policymakers to really bring together evidence and, uh, and public policy. Um, 
The report is available online. It's, it's a local report, but I think the uh, example that could be provided for other countries, for other countries that may use the example of bringing together the scientific community, we are in a very short time. We had more than 600 scientists participating in this process. Uh, and I think the, the example for other countries, especially those that uh, are not um, or that do not have uh, a scientific uh, infrastructure built within the countries, may be very useful. So uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and I appreciate Patricia for giving me the time to, to show you very briefly what these scientists have done. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your support uh, to the scientific community from, from the Chilean ministry. That we appreciate that. Uh, we've been given five more minutes, uh, so we can keep on taking questions from uh, the audience. And I see one over there, the lady in the pink. And please identify yourself. Thank you. My name is Megan Rowling. I'm a journalist um, with the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Two quick questions um, for um, uh, Patricia. Um, would you say that this process here in these halls, the UNFCCC, the COPS, um, is able to reflect the urgency of the science um, that has been spoken about today? And also interested in um, your comments and Johan's comments about social tipping point. Uh, what happens when we reach a social tipping point and action uh, does not meet people's expectations or demands? Thank you. You could, you could answer that and we can take further questions sure. later. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for <clears throat> those questions. Um, well, as I said, really, actually, what we have now under the process of the UNFCCC is not where we need to be. It is clearly, we are clearly uh, on track to double the, uh, the goal, the 1.5 degree goal. Um, however, this is why it is so important that we continue to bring momentum to the process. Next year, governments are uh, required under the Paris Agreement to present a new or revised uh, uh, national uh, climate plans, the nationally determined contributions. So this scientific evidence, um, together with the um, multiple examples of successful actions uh, to address climate change, uh, should be helpful to make uh, countries take much more ambitious goals towards uh, what, we, what we need to be. So um, when you say whether this process is able to reflect the sense of urgency, I think the process is able to bring together all the different uh, actors and elements that need to interact in order to get us there. We're not that there yet, but uh, we're working on it. Um, about the, the social tipping point, well, you know, when we say that climate change is a threat multiplier, I would say that it, it, it also relates to, to social issues. So if you have a problem of inequalities, climate change, the effects of climate change will deepen that uh, that problem. If you have a problem of poverty, climate change will deepen the problem and therefore uh, the likelihood of, uh, of more um, uh, social unrest uh, will, will be there. Uh, so it is really a, an, an issue that is very closely related to the well-being of, of societies. And in that regard, um, you can understand that um, this is something that will, uh, is very likely to create social um, unrest. Um, we are seeing, um, I would say, there is um, a lot of um, 
um, lack of satisfaction around the world with the uh, uh, institutions, with the uh, systems that we have in place. So we need to work on that, and one way of addressing that has to do with addressing climate change. Thank you. I could perhaps just, I mean, the, the, there is a deep, deep ethical point here, and I think the honest answer is we don't know really what may happen, but it's clear, and this is very painful to recognize, that the political leadership in the world is lagging behind the, the sentiments among youth in the world, the state of science, and even where business leadership is. So, of course, if you start seeing an uprising from below, there will be an enormous pressure for the political leadership to step up and start acting. And, of course, this can become a very, very dynamic symbiosis, but it can also be quite challenging along the way. But remember that we may be facing some interesting big moral tipping points here. Let's assume I was sitting right now taking up my cigarettes here and starting to smoke. I mean, across cultures, you would say, what the hell is he doing? You know, this, this would be perceived as unacceptable to subject you to my exhausts from my mouth. But we're accepting that happening every day in the exhausts from cars, for example. Are we approaching a tipping point where it will no longer be acceptable to shorten lives of people, like we see the data from New Delhi now, where young people are actually today an equivalent of smoking 10 cigarettes per day just because of the air pollution in the city that is killing over 7,000 people per year. I mean, this, this is the kind of moral implications that I start that I think we're starting to see. Thank you, Johan. Uh, we are running out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank all of those who have been part of this very distinguished panel. Um, they, we will be standing outside for further questions, at least some of us. Um, and particularly thank you to uh, the Executive Secretary, Patricia Espinosa, for being here today, and to the Science Minister of, of Chile. So thank you, everyone.